I was hanging Christmas lights in my front yard and my lights went out. I stepped back. My fence blew up about four inches under my armpit. And I still have the bullet hole through my fence in my front yard. No kidding. Somebody took a shot at you from a car? No, from, uh, from the woods across the street. What's up, everyone? Welcome back to another podcast. My name is Mike Perrine. This is the Everyday Detox Podcast. And on this episode, I sit down with research scientist Sam Shepard, the developer of Velasta Astaxanthin. I made a few videos on Astaxanthin and Velasta in particular on Sam's product. And I posted them on YouTube and Instagram and TikTok. And out of all the things I talk about, colonics, fasting, uh, cold plunging, I didn't think that Velasta Astaxanthin was going to be one of the most controversial posts that I had ever made. Uh, the video essentially went viral. We're up at about 2 million views, I think, combined across all the platforms. Really took off on TikTok. The comment section went nuts. Uh, some people uh, had really good things to say. And they said, I know Sam and his wife, and they helped us out tremendously. Thank you for teaching us about this. This is amazing. And other people said things like, how dare you take advantage of people, snake oil salesmen, you know, like it was, uh, they were not happy to see that post. Uh, people react very quickly to a two and a half minute video. So I thought, what a great opportunity. Let me have Sam on the podcast. Let us sit down and talk shop. We'll talk about his education. We'll talk about his work history. We'll talk about what led him to this discovery, his personal experience with disease and healing it. Uh, and we went deep, and this was a really, really fantastic podcast. I first learned about this and learned about Sam from my teacher and mentor, Dr. Fred Bishy, um, who told me to try some. And I, I remember I bought a bottle. I came in the mail. We were on our way out. I said, oh, I just want to try this stuff, honey, and I shot a few drops in my mouth. I wanted to taste it. It's essentially um, a very rich carotenoid, a very deep rich uh, antioxidant pigment and it's like a, a reddish orange but like the deepest reddish orange you've seen and um, I licked my lips and I didn't realize that I gave myself lipstick and my wife was like are you going to wear lipstick to Costco and I was like wait what um, but if you rub it and wash it off or put a little bit of oil or something like that it comes right off but I didn't realize that it'll give you a good 15-20 minute uh, shade of lipstick so uh, I tried it and I took it incrementally and I got it intellectually and I read everything I could on it. And uh, it wasn't until I got my second bottle that I said, I'm going to take this consistently every day just to see how it works. And I noticed a tremendous drop in inflammation in my body. Now, if I didn't live the lifestyle I lead because of the stress and the things that I have and the problems I try to try to solve when I'm trying to fall asleep at night and stuff like that, right? The things, it, it, my mind creates a lot of tension in my body. And uh, if I didn't do all of the wellness practices that I did, I'd probably be a real mess. So I still have a little bit of inflammation and tension. I can get headaches and, and muscle ache and things like that just from stress. And um, when I took this astaxanthin repetitively and consistently, I noticed the drop so quickly and I went, oh, wow. I said, I really feel it now. And, you know, Dr. Bishy said, look, he goes, um, he goes I, I ignored this in the beginning. He said, uh, I thought it was just another one of these health products because we've seen so many. I mean, I've been, a pra I've been into this lifestyle for 30 years. I've been a practitioner for 22 of those years. Dr. Bishy has been into this for what? He's in his 90s now. So 55 years, 60 years, something like that. And there's been all sorts of products that have come out that uh, intellectually, they make a lot of sense. You read through it and you go, oh, that's how this works. And then you take it and you go, I don't know if this works. I have no idea if this is if this is the real deal. You know, I get what they're promoting. I get what the salespeople are saying, but I have no idea. And then you find yourself, you spend hundreds of dollars and you don't know if it did anything to you. Well, Fred said, look, I had clients take this and I ignored it. He said, they weren't even working my diet the way that I wanted them to. And they were having tremendous success reversing disease. He goes, a lot of them weren't even really doing the diet I put them on at all. He works with people with nutritional detox, juicing and, and raw plant-based foods and manipulating their diet, changing their eating times, doing things to create an environment in their body that can help them recover from serious disease. And that's how Fred has always gotten his results. That's how a lot of natural health practitioners get their results. Uh, 
But they, somebody, some one of his clients got turned on to it and a number of them started taking it and they started having some pretty serious results. And he said, after like the 10th time, I couldn't ignore it anymore. And then he connected with Sam, talked shop. They did some Instagram lives and things like that. I watched those and I went, okay, yeah, this is fascinating. I'm going to take this more. And that's when I ordered my second bottle. And I don't get behind things that I don't believe in. Um, I really believe in this product. And there are very few companies I have an affiliation with. Uh, Velasta is one of them. I get behind some of the Purium stuff. I really love their green powders. Their barley greens are like sweet and delicious. And I can tell the green powders that Purium has are very like, um, they're very vital. Um, of course, I get behind cold plunging and infrared saunas, and I'm an affiliate for some of those companies as well. Uh, but otherwise, that's about it. I don't get behind too many things. But this one's at, at my top top of the list for me. Um, so if you want to support this podcast, you can purchase Velasta Astaxanthin through the link in the show description or the link uh, in my bio. And uh, the code is PURE, all caps, PURE. And that gives you a little discount um, on the product. And that helps me out tremendously. And it also helps you out with a discount. Um, also, if you want to support this podcast, you can visit everydaydetoxacademy.com. And that is the crown jewel of all of the work that I've done here, all of the content I've produced on social media and in the podcast. Uh, that is an online course academy, a digital course academy, uh, where Gil Jacobs is up next with his masterclass on deep tissue cleansing. And my signature course, Eliminating the Toxic Load, takes all of my 22 years, condenses it down into three and a half hours. It is, I am the most proud of that out of anything I have ever done. So if you want to support this podcast, please enroll in the Academy, or you can also purchase some Velasta Astaxanthin. Uh, and I really hope you guys enjoy this one. Sam is super intelligent. It does get a little bit technical in, in spots, but uh, you know I'm sure we can all keep up and uh, we can understand the power of rich carotenoid antioxidants. And the way Sam breaks it down to help us understand it, it's, he does a tremendous job. So anyway, really hope you guys love this one. And uh, yeah, let's jump right in. Oh, one more thing before we start. So when I was editing this episode, I realized that I started recording on Zoom before Sam was even fully set up. So they were still setting up um, the audio and the video on his side, but we were small talking and he was telling me this really interesting story about meeting a cardiologist on an airplane and helping that cardiologist with his skin conditions and then how that cardiologist invited Sam and his wife to have their hearts looked at because they had used astaxanthin for so long and he wanted to see what effects it would have. Uh, so it's a really interesting story and we weren't officially started yet. So the first 10 to 12 minutes of this podcast is just some Zoom uh, footage of me chatting with Sam about this. And it sort of starts in the middle of nowhere. So I thought I would give a little preface to that. And I always forget to say this, but if you're watching this on YouTube, if you would not mind, please, if you like the video, please like it. Please subscribe to the channel if you get any value from these podcasts. And if you're listening on a podcast app, it really helps for you to leave a review. All right, guys, thanks so much. Let's jump right in. We volunteered to, for a cardiologist, a world-renowned cardiologist, to go in and look at our heart and arteries. Well, tell him how you met him. Yeah, I met him on a plane between Rome and Frankfurt. We actually sat next, uh, beside each other, and it was just had a, a, a total um, sequence of probably six or seven events that we even got us on the plane together, from cancellations to airport shutdowns to all of a sudden we end up in Rome together when we sat next to each other going from Rome to Frankfurt. And uh, we struck up a conversation, and um he uh, he asked me a series of questions on covid and uh, I, we got into a discussion on that and then um i told him about velasta and, and the luck we were having with uh with cancer and basically inflammatory type issues and he said uh he said you does it work on psoriatic arthritis psoriasis or, or psoriasis i'm sorry and uh i said oh uh, Absolutely. And uh, so he pulled his sleeve up and here his whole forearm was loaded with psoriasis. He's my age. He's 70. And I said, well, we can we can stop that in about seven days. He looked at me. He said, he said, what? He, I said, yeah, we stop about seven days. He said, 
He said, Sam, he said, he said, let me tell you something. He said, I've been a doctor for 42 years. He said, don't you think I've taken every man-made drug there is for this? And I said, yeah, you probably have. And he said, now I'm sitting next to a guy who's telling me that he can get rid of it in seven days. I said, well, it might take 10. <laughs> he, sort of, he just sort of looked at me, rolled his eyes and looked out the window. He was sitting next to the, next to the window. And he said, he said, you've got to be joking. And I said, no, I said, I'm not. I said, there's no side effects. You might as well try it. I said, here, I, Tommy's got a bottle. I'll just give it to you. So he took it and he was, he was going on to Poland. He's the number one cardiologist in Poland. And right now he's doing work there with the Ukrainians and all that. But uh, Tommy and I came back to the States and about seven days later, Two o'clock in the morning, I get a phone call. And uh, I don't know whether we're re recording or not now, but um, he said, um, he said, Sam, he said, he said, what the F is this? I said, well, I said, what do you mean? Because I'm thinking he's got a bad symptom or something. Bad reaction, right? Yeah. And and I, I said, is, is there a problem? He says, no. He says, he says, what the F is this? And I said, what's going on? He said, this is the first day I woke up in 42 years without psoriasis. Wow. And so he and I stayed in contact over the next year. He started prescribing it to his cardiac patients. And their C-reactive proteins started down there. They, he started to get reversal on plaque formation. And it really got his attention. So he called... Tommy and I, and said, uh, you two have been on this longer than any other human beings on the planet. He said, would you two volunteer to come into my lab in San Antonio? He's a professor there at the Heart Institute. And uh, he, he said, we'd like to go in. It's invasive. We go in, we take, we look in your heart, we look in all your coronary arteries and up into your brain, and he, we want to see what's going on here. And I said, okay. So he, he said, well, why don't you both come over and, and you know, we'll do you first and then we'll do Tommy right after you. I said, no, no, no. I said, I said, you can do me first, but if you kill me, uh, Tommy's got to at least have be able to make the decision on whether she wants to do this or not. He, he chuckled. He says, I understand. He said, then we'll do Tommy the next day. I said, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so went in at about 6.30 in the morning, Went in, I watched the whole thing. I actually have a video of it. And um, I came back out, was in recovery. They had a little sheet across the, the bottom of the bed. And he came in and just threw that across the, threw it open. He says, I am amazed. He said, for a 70-year-old, he said, you have a coronary structure of a 20-year-old. He said, there's no plaque. We can't find any calcium buildup, even in the arterial walls which is highly unusual for someone your age. He said, um, he said, I, that's the good news. The, he said, I have some bad news. And I said, what's that? He said, well, we found a congenital heart defect in you. And I, you know, I asked him, you know, what, what it was. And he said, you have uh, on your lab, on your, Widowmaker. It's actually the lateral arterial descending around the coronary around the heart. You have what's called a, a severe systolic kink. Every time your heart beats, that main artery kinks, shuts the blood supply off to my heart on every heartbeat. Not the whole. It and what blesses it, right? And uh, I. I've got the video of it and he, he showed it to me and I said, well, what does this mean? He said, well, he said, you've lived with it for 70 years. He said, it's genetic. And uh, I said, well, well, how much time do I, you know, can you fix it? He said, oh no. He said, we can't put a stint in that kink. That kink will crush the stint. So it, it's not, you know, it's not repairable. And since you have no plaque formation, you're not going to have a heart attack. There's not going to be something stick in the kink and cause you to have a heart attack. I said, well, how, how long can you live with this? He said, oh, he said, I'll give you, I'm 70. He said, I'll give you another 30 years. 
<laughs> Sounds like We're a deal, in. Sam. Sounds like a deal. I'd take that. But they went in the next day with Tommy. Yeah. Now her cholesterol runs 220 to 240 and has without medication ever. So he really thought they were going to find something on her. It came back. She's completely clear in her arteries. And he he came in again and he said, I, I am shocked. He said, you're within the, the one percentile of the 15,000 cases that I've done. He said, I've never seen this in this age group. He called all the staff over and he said, I want every one of you on Velasta. So tell me something. So with these results, so it's the antioxidant capacity of the Velasta that's helping to reduce um, damage to the arterial walls that would normally um, begin the process of accumulating uh, plaque buildup. Is that how it's working? Yeah, he he hit it. He, he got it very, very quickly. What causes the plaque to form is like a scab forming on a wound. So you end up with, on the um, endothelial cells of the artery, you end up with inflammation at that cell wall. And it's typically um, when there's inflammation, the LDL cholesterol will start plating out like a scab on the inside uh, of that artery. And LDL removes, uh, 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 um, sorry, HDL removes LDL. So there's a ratio issue there, but th it's the LDL that poses the problem. And if you don't have that inflammatory response or that inflammatory disease, then you won't get atherosclerosis. It's that simple. And they've known this. He, he was fully on board. Um, he said, we run in the cardiac units, we run C-reactive proteins to see what their inflammatory disease state is. And that's an indicator, a precursor to heart disease. And he, now with, uh, with Velasta, the CRP drops well below uh, 10 is what he shoots for, but well below three. And now there's no uh, net accumulation of the inflammatory disease, which now allows the HDL to start cleaning the plaque off of those arteries. So he's looking for reversal with this, and that's what he's monitoring now. Well, in his parameter, he he's looking at 10 or below. That's his standard for success. Wow. You know, I've never had a, I've never had a, a C-reactive protein test. I don't think I have. I mean, I, I know I'll ask for one uh, the next time I go, but I also didn't have... I didn't go to a doctor for almost 20 years until I married my wife and got health insurance. So um, uh, luckily, I did not need to go. Actually, I went to the doctor three times and they were all um, very well-meaning disasters when I went. Um, misdiagnoses, prescriptions of things that um, turned out to damage tendons. I didn't take any of these things. I was very holistic minded and questioned a lot. But uh, luckily, uh, I didn't need any of them. Um, but I will have that test run. I'm super curious because I actually do run a lot of inflammation in my body, mostly generated from stress. So, and, and sometimes lack of sleep, but I'm working on that. But, um, that's where I really, you know, I understood Velasta intellectually, you know, Dr. Bishy, who's been a long, long dear friend of mine for, for 30 years now. Um, you know, he, w when he tells me about something, I take it seriously. I bought a bottle. I took it incrementally i didn't i didn't take enough i wanted to try it i wanted to experience it um but it wasn't until the second time i started taking it i said okay i'm going to do this regularly now i'm going to take it every single day that immediately i noticed that the tension and pain in my body started to drop away some of the stress was still there but i know but i felt it immediately which there's a lot of things i get intellectually with health products that make sense on paper but i take them and i go i don't know if they work or not but the last i was like oh wait a second i was like i noticed something immediate here and as do a lot of the people that I've recommended to take it, yeah. I've always had the same problem, Michael, with, with holistic, is that people say it works, but they don't have a clue as to why. When I get into the Velasta, it took me eight years to figure out why this was working. What, you know, what is it from a scientific point of view as to why is this working so well? Um, when someone um, gets on something like, um, I don't know, um, vitamin C? Yeah, well, no, it wouldn't be vitamin C, but some of the, um, even some of the mushrooms, some of the, the, you know, the thistle, those kinds of things. Nobody really knows what is why they feel better. They just know that when they take that, it's it's sort of anecdotal. 
in in my case in and in in what i do i i can't be anecdotal i i, it, it, I have to know why it works or i'm not going to use it and if it can't be explained then i i sort of shy away from it well that's because that's because you're a scientist and you come from that world so let's start the podcast here because we sort of just like went off to the races i recorded all of that by the way because it was an amazing amazing story of uh of um, you know, you, you having your heart checked. Um, so that will make it somewhere in the podcast. But let's start here because one of the things, so I, out of all the things that I'm into and that I promote, I'm a colon hydrotherapist. So, and I've been one for 22 years. I didn't think that talking about Velasta on social media and on YouTube was going to be the most controversial thing that I talked about. Um, that was probably one of the most viewed videos we have well over uh probably about a million and a half views maybe almost two million views at this point just on that one video and i've made some follow-up videos the comment section we have almost two thousand comments on it um the different social media um platforms have their own sort of temperament TikTok people can be a little bit rough and they kind of come there for a fight uh looking for trouble instagram can be a little bit more um, people tend to be a little bit more intelligent and open-minded on Instagram. Um, I don't know how much you use any of these platforms, but I, I use them often. Uh, and there were, if you looked at any of those comments, some of them were super positive. Some people were like, I stayed with Sam and Tommy. I know them. They helped me so much. And then other people were like, you know, snake oil. This man doesn't even exist. He has no education. You can't find like they were, there was just all of this sort of like, you know, like back and forth going on in the comment section. Um, so let's start a little bit with your background, because some of the most wild things I heard is they were like, Sam doesn't exist. We can't find him on the Google name scientist search. There's some type of like Google scientist search. I don't know what it is, but like, I guess your name's not on it. There's probably a lot of people whose names aren't on it, but that's like all they needed was like five seconds of research to determine that you were lying about your education and everything like that. So I just want to get a little bit into who you are and the work that you did. Um, and yeah, if you would like to tell me about that. From an education point of view, I have uh, undergraduate degrees focused on chemistry and physics. I have a bachelor's of science from chemical engineering from Ohio University. If someone wants to check um, I have a master's in biochemistry and environmental engineering uh, from Murray State University in Kentucky, and uh, also have a doctor of divinity in biblical studies. I have 41 international and domestic patents. They can Google, go to the U.S. Patent Office, do a quick search if, if they were truly interested in it, and they can Google Shepherd, S-H-E-P-H-E-R-D, in one line and then under the other line, my attorney who is Egbert, E-G-B-E-R-T, and the entire listing of all the patents that I have will, will, will pop up. So, um, so from an educational point of view, from an educational or from a commercial point of view, I um, came out of college, went to work for Union Carbide in uh, the production mass polymerization of polystyrene. I then uh, moved into Gulf Oil and uh, began making polysulfone, which is the plastic used to make space helmets, and then um, moved into polyvinyl chloride with a company called Air Products out of uh, Paducah, Kentucky. And was, that was most of my early engineering life. And so I knew a lot about free radicals. Uh, could we use free radicals to initiate those polymerizations? So uh, I was very well educated in free radical um, chemistry. And um, so after that, um, I had formed a company called Bioset. <clears throat> and um, uh, it was a technology to sterilize sludge um, from a municipal wastewater treatment plant. And now it's used throughout the world. It, I, we, we put facilities in, in, uh, in China. Um, and then in 1991, 1993, I was asked to uh, participate on what's called the Lunar Outpost Commission. The project name was Artemis. And I had two projects there. One was to generate electricity with no moving parts on the moon, only using the moon's natural resources. And then the second one was how do we, from an engineering point of view, 
install lab habs. These are laboratories and habitat uh, containers. They, they were going to be inflatable containers, and we were going to set those on the moon. And the idea was Pioneer 10 found water on the southernmost crater of the moon. It's frozen. It's a so, solid block of, of ice, probably from a comet. So the fuel to go to Mars already exists. Uh, all we have to do is get to the moon. So the stepping stone was Earth to moon, and that took some of the risk out. We had to maintain a uh, REID, which is a risk of imminent injury or death of less than 3%. So by going from the Earth to the moon, we would build all of the facilities on the moon because we work very well in one-sixth gravity. And then we needed a way to generate electricity to electrolyze the water we found on the moon into hydrogen and oxygen for the fuel because that was the biggest cost component of going to Mars was the fuel, the payload. And here the payload was already on the moon. Wow, so, so you were working, is this, was this with NASA? It was with what's called the Lunar Outpost Commission. NASA was actually initiated the Lunar Outpost Commission. It was a project named uh, Artemis, 1991 to 19, uh, really 1994 is when it ended. Has, has it ended? That that project hasn't continued in some way? Is that like in process now? I really thought we were going to Mars, Michael. And um, it ended in 1994 after the medical team completed their study and shown that no, no man can go to Mars. The radiation was too extreme. Uh, after about two months uh, outside the Van Allen belt of the Earth, you die from in inflammatory disease. Typically, it's going to be cancer. All this work that Elon Musk is doing, talking about going to Mars, is he trying to problem solve that? Are you familiar with what he's doing? He picked up the Artemis uh, volumes. So he was fully aware of the work we had done, 1991, 1994. And he was fully on board with what Artemis, what the Artemis project was. And he actually named the first rocket Artemis One, by the way. That's where that name came from. There's three things I had told the engineers at SpaceX that was going to result in failure. The reason they cannot go to Mars right now is the REID is greater than 6%. So NASA will not allow a launch unless it's 3% uh, or less. And right now, no one can go to Mars. And there's three things. There's what's called uh, Kegers, Leps, and Seps. The Kegers are cosmic rays. Leps are um, light energy. These are light nuclei of hydrogen, helium, traveling at the speed of light. Very high energy particles. And then um, uh, the SEPs are solar event particles. Solar event particles are large nuclei, like iron, traveling at the speed of light. And when you get outside the magnetic field of the Earth, you are now susceptible to all of those. And there's, there's only two materials I know that can stop a stop those from penetrating the spacecraft, and that's carbon borite. Now, there's some alloys that they're working with now that can stop what's called the spatter. When, the, when a particle goes through, let's say, aluminum or iron, it's a small hole going in, but it leaves a lot of particles of aluminum or iron now traveling at the speed of light like a shotgun blast on, a, on an atomic level hitting the astronauts. That's a serious problem. It sounds to me like human beings are not meant to leave the planet Earth. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're not intended to do that. I love it from an intellectual perspective, but I'm, I'm sort of against all the funding and money to try to put us on Mars and things like that. I just think it's... I can tell you the reason they're doing it. They have full knowledge that they cannot go to Mars. But the idea is, and this is um, just recent, really, um, I knew that we couldn't go to Mars. And in March of 2020, I was asked to go back onto Artemis. Um, Trump was going to start a, um, a moon mission, called, actually a new division called Space Force at that point. I chose not to do it because I knew it had nothing to do with going to Mars. And I know this is going to be very controversial and people are going to send you letters and notes, but the whole idea of promoting going to Mars is there's no way we can get funding 
if we told Congress that we were going to go to the moon first and build military bases. But if we go to Congress and we say, we're gonna go build bases on the moon and then go to Mars, everybody in Congress will fund that, but nobody will ever go to Mars. You can't make it, but it will put a military base on the moon. In November of 2022, we, uh, I was granted a patent and you can find it at the patent office um, on the elimination of inflammatory disease resulting from radiation sickness. So people that get exposed to radiation, we did it primarily for people who were getting radiation treatments for cancer. They were getting burned on the backside of them where the radiation comes through and it would burn their tissue. But those who were on Velasta didn't get those same burns. So when we began to look at it, I filed a patent on it on the Velasta being used to mitigate the damage caused by radiation. It turns out that the astronauts could also do it to mitigate their inflammatory response in the trip to Mars. I imagine this would be an essential supplement for even um, an airline crew, because I understand from what I understand is, you know, we're always exposed to radiation as we uh, you know, whenever we take flights, not just from the security screening, but from just from the altitude. So um, that would be such a valuable supplement for somebody working in that industry. There's a woman, um, uh, her name was um, Diana Fairchild, and she wrote a book called Jet Smarter. And her doctor actually told her she had to stop being a flight attendant because of uh, f of toxicity from flying. And it had to do with a lot of different chemicals they were using in the air from, um, you know, just cleaning products to uh, uh, pesticides with luggage and things like that. Uh, but the radiation was a big part of it. Uh, and she wrote this great book called Jet Smarter about how to reduce your toxicity when flying in an airplane. Uh, but sounds like this would be, uh, Velasta would be an essential supplement. We haven't even gotten to how it works in the podcast, but um, yeah. So that's, those are the two patents we have. One is the one that was granted in uh, uh, 2019, I believe, 2020, um, on the glucosidic form of the astaxanthin. That's why it's different than the astaxanthin you see in Walmart. Our patent, we have the only patent on a supplement, which is, was unheard of until now, but the, the, the we, we had to submit a lot of research and the patent office issued the patent on the glucosidic form of the astaxanthin. Let's, let's talk about this for a second, because one of the um, major uh, questions and I guess criticisms, and just by the way, just, you know, the comment section of these social media platforms, these are not necessarily qualified people to be making these, but these, but this is what the community comes up with uh, just, you know, based off of my two minute, two and a half minute video, right? Um, one was how do you patent a natural substance? Um, and just to, to, to clarify, so you didn't, you didn't patent astaxanthin, you patented the, the, um, process of extraction and manipulation that you've done to it to make it most effective. Is that right? Am I right in saying that? Correct. It, it, we, it, it turns out that the glucosidic and, uh, and the liposomal form of astaxanthin, when they refer to liposomal astaxanthin, all they're talking about is a mixture of oil plus astaxanthin. They're not chemically attached. Two separate molecules floating in the same media. Mixed up in a bowl almost, not... Mixed up in a bowl. It's like mixing yeah. nails and tacks. You can reach in and pull out a nail. You can reach in and pull out a tack. What we found was that that's not the liposomal or the glucosidic form of what we're talking about. We actually take the glucose molecule and chemically attach it to the astaxanthin. You cannot separate those two. They are a molecule of their own. That's the difference. So that is patentable, but it turns out that in the algae, basic to the algae itself, where the astaxanthin is, the algae only produces the glucosidic form of astaxanthin. They didn't know this. So when we take the, the algae and we run it through what's called CO2, supercritical CO2 extraction, we split the glucose off. It's such a high energy extraction. And you end up with the pure astaxanthin. The glucose is floating away over here, washed away. 
So now you have the pure astaxanthin. They take that dry astaxanthin, they mix it in fish oil or olive oil, and that becomes the astaxanthin you see in Walmart. But it's just the, the single molecule of astaxanthin. And is there any value to that, just taking those? I mean, does the body utilize some? There is. It, yeah, it, there is. it just takes eight times. It's called a concentration gradient. It takes eight times more of that astaxanthin to give you the same effects as you get with Velasta. So if I take 100 milligrams a day to stop my cancer, then I have to take over 800 milligrams, and you'll see it in the NIH papers. When they do the work with the mice, they're using 100 milligrams per kilogram of body weight per day. Now, we, with Velasta, we use one milligram per kilogram of body weight. Huge difference. So what they're doing with the pure astaxanthin, you have to use eight times more to get the same effect that you get with the glucosidic form. Why is that? What, what does, the, um, what does the, the glucose and the fat, like how does that work upon, like how does that increase the delivery? There's, in, in the pharmaceutical field and in the military, in the bioweapons development, it was common knowledge to put a glucosidic or liposomal molecule attached to your active ingredient. I did that. I, I, I developed certain things. But in the pharmaceutical side, that's a basic form of biochemistry on how to attach it. Now, with glucosidic astaxanthin, you have what's called insulin receptors and glucose channels. So when insulin, for example, uh, cancer, let, let's take cancer, it takes uh, 32 molecules of glucose to produce two molecules of ATP. In a normal cell, it only takes two molecules of glucose to make two molecules of ATP. Cancer cells are actually anaerobic. They're, they're a yeast. They behave as a yeast or a fungus. In the way that they make energy, right? In the way that they- That's the way they make energy. It's very inefficient. They have to use a lot of sugar, a lot of glucose, or there's some ketones they can use, but primarily it's sugar. And that sugar then goes in and um, through those glucose channels. Now, cancer cells will have more glucose channels on its cell membrane than a normal cell will because it needs more sugar. Cancer cells have priority over all the sugar that you produce. You cannot kill cancer by cutting out sugar because over 88% of all the glucose your body uses, your liver converts from glycogen into glucose and cancer has priority statistically over all of that sugar that your body produces. So your normal cells will starve. That's why cancer patients lose weight. But cancer cells are all fat, dumb and happy because they statistically get hundreds of times more sugar than a normal cell does and the normal cell dies. That's interesting that the body prioritizes those cells. Cancer has to produce more insulin receptors and more glucose channels on its cell membrane. It's cluttered with them because it needs more sugar to survive. Cancer plays, believe it or not, on a very shaky edge. It's, um, I find it remarkable that it even exists and can survive, but it does. Um, but when you have a hundred times more glucose channels on your cell membrane than a normal cell, you have a hundred times when a glucose molecule comes passing by of it dropping into the cancer cell versus dropping, of dropping into the normal cell. And that's how it works. So when we put the glucose onto the astaxanthin, the cancer cell sees that glucose. It pulls that glucose in and it's chemically attached. It's called a Trojan horse. It's chemically attached to the astaxanthin and it pulls the astaxanthin intracellular into the cell with it. The cancer splits the glucose off and uses it for energy. And it's done by, with, with severing proteins and there's, there's things. But now the astaxanthin is floating inside the cancer cell. Now, cancer cells produce the hydroxyl free radical. 
Anytime you convert sugar in the mitochondria into energy, you generate hydroxyl free radical. And that's any cell? Any cell. Healthy or cancer, yep. okay. And that's why we have glutathione and that's why we have, have superoxide dismutase to, to knock those down. Right. Endogenous um, antioxidants, right. But the mitochondria of a cancer cell is using a lot of sugar, generating a lot of hydroxyl free radicals just to stay alive. Now that hydroxyl free radical is an OH with a zero charge. It just means that it has the same number of protons as it has electrons. It's, new, it's electrically balanced, but it has an unpaired electron in one of its orbitals. And it needs to fill that orbital. So it will steal an electron from anything it bumps into. And what it steals an electron from, that then becomes a free radical. You can never get, re get rid of free radicals except through antioxidant uh, um, absorption or, or chemical reaction. So now you have this astaxanthin in there. The hydroxyl free radical carries a pH between 5.2 and 6.8. It's acidic. Cancer cells live in an acidic environment. And that's why it is. Now, when the acidic environment outside the cancer cell will kill normal cells, and those normal cells adjacent to a cancer cell cannot live in an acidic environment, that cancer cell will kill it and make room for itself to grow. And that's why normal cells are dying. Then when the astaxanthin comes in, you get the OH having a zero charge. The astaxanthin can donate an electron as an antioxidant to the OH zero charge and convert it into an OH minus one. Now, when it does that, now it's a, a hydroxyl ion. A hydroxyl ion runs the pH up over 11 inside the cancer cell and kills the cancer cell in less than four seconds. So this is like this is like the you know talking Dr. Fred Bishy. This is like the diet and lifestyle of high vitamin C rich antioxidant pigment foods on a sl like you know that's like the 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 slow build to disease prevention. Velasta is like throwing Mike Tyson in there with a cancer cell. It, it's the only supplement that we know of that can donate electrons and itself not become an inflammatory. It's the only one that does that. Vitamin C, high doses of vitamin C, you can get into a liver inflammatory response because vitamin C is a pro-oxidant. When it's metabolized in the liver, it generates these hydroxyl free radicals. So you got to be very careful with all supplements that are pro-oxidants. Vitamin C therapies for cancer then need to be looked at very carefully because there's a certain threshold of damage that can start to occur from the over introduction of vitamin C and the way that it metabolizes. Correct. When it's metabolized in the liver, you'll see your C-reactive protein increase. Um, Vitamin C follows a dose response curve that looks like a normal distribution curve, a bell-shaped curve. You increase the dose of vitamin C, you get a very positive response. More vitamin C, a more positive response, and then you tip over. There's a concentration and it's dependent on the individual as to how they metabolize it. It'll tip over. Now more vitamin C is gonna give you an inflammatory disease. You got to be very, very careful. Well, that makes sense because it, it, at that point, I imagine the, the the volume would be something out of balance with nature, right? It's not like you're getting vitamin C from spinach and your body's going into a negative response. Like, no, like you're not eating that much spinach, right? But you're talking about some type of supplemental dosage, right? So where it starts to showing and then it tips over. That's exactly right. And um, so, but astaxanthin is the only material we know that itself never becomes an inflammatory pro-oxidant. So you can take very high doses and your body just will, will flush it. It'll just push it out. So there's no side effects to the astaxanthin. There's no inflammatory response from overdose. And is taking um, 
is taking it orally the most effective route or would there be other ways to do this? I mean, obviously it's very effective. And I want to talk about how you even discovered this because we, we kind of skipped over that and started rolling into talking shop. But uh, before we do that, so is that the, is that the most effective way to do it? Is there, is there any like, um, is it any creams or, in, or IVs or any, or any way that it should be administered other than orally? Um, all of our work has, has been done orally. Now we've done things with DMSO and we see it, DMSO very readily will carry it right through your skin tissue. With DMSO, you got to worry about, since it's a universal solvent, it will carry whatever is in it into your bloodstream too. So, but we do have a salve that is DMSO based for wounds, for melanoma, for basal cell. Um, you put it on there and it, it, it goes away. You actually see it go into your tissue. That, that rich pigment goes disappears into your tissue. Wow. I bought a bottle of DMSO once, a really expensive bottle. And I, as I was opening it up and I, I cracked the safety seal, something happened and it splashed up. And I can see that it was it was a clear safety seal that had some black writing that probably said safety seal or something on it. And it just instantly dissolved. And I saw a couple of drops of it drip into my DMSO. And I was like, oh, it's just money out the window. I had to get rid of it. When we made polysulfone plastic for the space helmets, one of the solvents that we used was large amounts of DMSO. The other solvent was monochlorobenzene. So we had to be very, very careful because in our recovery unit where those solvents are combined, if you touched a drop of that, monochlorobenzene is a liver toxin. And the DMSO would carry it right through your skin and it would end up accumulating in your liver. So it was something in the chemical industry we had to watch pretty carefully. I was going to ask you about that because I want to get to, to how you even started thinking about this. And when you were describing your background and the stuff, um, you, the projects you were working on, a lot of the substances that you uh, were talking about and working with, I was wondering if you think any of that or exposure to that contributed to the cancer that you eventually developed. Yeah, I had a cancer called polycythemia vera. It was a bone blood cancer. Um, it's so difficult, Michael, to prove um, cause and effect when it comes to cancer because cancer won't present anywhere from one to 15 years after you've been exposed. So yes, I, I dealt with, with chemicals. I dealt with styrene. I dealt with uh, vinyl chloride. I, I was contaminated with those. I was contaminated with monochlorobenzene, DMSO, uh, phenol. So in, in my life, I was exposed to that. But also, um, um, I was developing electromagnetic pulse weapons and auditory weapons for, for the military. So in the electromagnetic pulse spectrum, which typically hits the bone marrow, by the way, you can get into these kinds of issues. And I may have gotten lax, who knows? There's no way I can go back, but there's no history of this at all in my family. So it's probably something environmental that got me. And so you were working um, and you had a research team at the time, and then you had this diagnosis happen. Uh, was that just absolutely terrifying for you? Were you just like, oh, like, was it? I was having problems with with blood pressure and i had gone in and had all the cardiac work done all the stress tests they couldn't find anything my blood pressure was high i knew there was something wrong how old were, how old were you at the time by the way that, ha that was in 2003 so i was 50 years old and um we went through a series of tests and then i just received a phone call on a sunday night the nurse the doctor wanted to see me in the morning and i went in and um Whenever you get a call like that and the doctor wants to see you at 7.30 in the morning, it's usually not good. So I go in and he just wheels his chair up and he said, I've got bad news. And I said, what's that? He said, you've got polycythemia vera. And I said, what the hell is that? He said, it's an incurable bone cancer. And I said, well, what about chemo or radiation? And he just shook his head no. And I... um I sort of remember looking down, I guess. What a blessing that you were out of the possibility of going with traditional treatments. Be because it, 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 I, I'm, I'm sure in some way it directed your mind to problem solving. Yeah, looking back, that's true. At the time, I thought it was a death sentence. You know, there's no hope. 
I mean, that's what that guy was, that's what he was telling me. I said, uh, I said, well, what's my prognosis? And he said, in your current condition, you have 10 minutes to 10 years. He said, 97% of the people will perish within 10 years. And I said, well, what about the 10 minutes? He said, your blood is so thick right now that you could throw a blood clot to your brain, your heart, or your lung. And if it happened right now, it would take me 10 minutes to declare you dead. He said, you're off to the hospital. So I leave the doctor's office, go to the hospital, and they phlebotomize me. They remove blood from me. And I had to do that every month for four years. You then decide that you're not happy with this diagnosis. Um, you had four years of thinking, I imagine, before they you, you had to stop having that done. And um, what led you to start thinking about this algae, this antioxidant? Because I imagine that there's a lot of tools, you know, uh, a lot of weapons in your arsenal in regards to um, different paths you could have taken with this. Yeah. One of the programs that I had gotten into was with DARPA, the Department of Defense. And we were, we were doing um, algae to jet fuel. But when I, during that period, it was pretty apparent that I needed to um, figure out what animals did not get cancer. That's where my research truly started. So I found five animals that the NIH and the Marine Sciences Group of NOAA apparently don't get cancer. The salmon, pink flamingos, sharks, elephants, and naked mole rats. In the comment section, a lot of people wanted to wanted to get technical and say that t sharks do indeed get cancer. And I told them I would ask you about this on the podcast. They do, but but it but it's such a low rate. It, it it's not absolute. It's just that these were the animals that had the lowest cancer rate. That uh, so Scripps Scripps Oceanographic was a team that had done a lot of research on this. So I had asked them to break those five species down and see what molecules existed across all five of those species. Well, they came back and they said, well, we found astaxanthin. And I said, what's astaxanthin? And they said, well, it's a molecule found in an algae called Hematococcus pluvialis. So I began growing that algae. I got it from the University of Texas in Austin. And I began growing it in the little Intex hot tubs that you could blow up. I don't know if you've seen these at Walmart or what, but I call them hillbilly hot tubs. So I put a plastic cover on it, inflated it, had it in my backyard, and I could grow the algae in that. And when I began taking it, I didn't know whether it was gonna do what it, what it was gonna do. But in, in the back of my mind, I, I had contracts. Nobody is gonna to wanna to do business with a dead or dying man. So, that was my motivation was if I don't get this solved, I'm done. Yeah. I mean, a lot. I mean, it, it's your life on the line, but also your livelihood on the line. And yeah, exactly. So um, I began eating the algae itself. The biomass of the algae. What does that taste like? And what does that look like? Is it a bowl of jelly? It's like eating grass, like eating grass. It, okay. Yeah. So I would I would skim it off. I would I learn how to stress it to make it produce, turn red from green to red. I would skim it off and uh, dry it and eat it. I'd put it in eggs, and I knew it was 3.8% astaxanthin, so I could calculate my dose based on how many grams of algae to eat. Okay, so you're just putting it in food. You weren't eating bowls of algae. That's, that's the vision I had in my head. I said, what does that look like, eating algae, biomass of algae? Yeah. Yeah, so um, I began um, doing it that way, and at four milligrams uh, per day, my phlebotomies after about four, four or five months got pushed out to once every two months. So you got results just in the raw form. You hadn't even developed any of the, the, the manipulations that you did to make it more effective. You're just eating it almost as it would appear in nature, even though you were growing it. But now, um, when we began to look at it, the algae actually produces it in the glucosidic form. We didn't know it at the time. I didn't know it at the time. And... Uh, um, is it possible, Michael, to take a break? Let me go get a glass of water. Yeah, sure. I have to go to the bathroom actually too. So let's do that. And I'm just going to leave everything rolling here so I don't have any issues later. And we'll go do that. Let's do it. Okay, we're back from our quick little break. 
And uh, we were just talking about um, we were just talking about the origin story of how you started growing this algae, um, growing it yourself, growing it in a hillbilly hot tub in uh, your backyard, <laughs> which is fascinating. Um, so you were putting it in food. You had, uh, and then your treatments started to uh, become less and less. It went from one month to two months. With polycythemia, um, typically your bone marrow will produce three to six million red blood cells every day. That's just a normal production rate. In my case, because it was a stem cell, mine was what's called a JAK2 STAT3 mutation. I was producing 35 million to 65 million red blood cells every day. My blood was like ketchup. I actually felt my blood pressure increasing. I felt my eyes bulge. I knew when I had to go in and get phlebotomized. Can you look at pictures of yourself and see it from then versus how you look now? Not really. Uh, I was heavier, I guess. I looked more pudgy, I think, more than anything else. But I always had a problem with, um, I mean, my face would flush. I would get this red, real quick flush um, at times. Um, I had night sweats really bad. You must have counted the days until your appointments <laughs> to get in, huh? Probably felt great for a week or two, and then... Yeah, there were moments where I would just go in, but um, um, every morning, you know, you wake up and did this for a long time. You look in the mirror and you go, well, God, is today the day I, I get to meet you? Uh, you just never knew when it was going to happen. Especially when, when a doctor tells you you have between 10 minutes and 10 years, you don't know what that's ever going to look like, yeah. Um, yeah, that sets somebody up psychologically in a really weird place, you know? Um, especially when someone's trying to heal. When, when I began to do the algae, um, I started out at four milligrams. My phlebotomies got pushed out to once every two months. My my blood work looked looked fine, except for my hemoglobin. Um, it would still climb out, but the slope of the curve was was changed. So I thought, well, everything's okay. Let's go to twelve milligrams a day. And I did that, and my phlebotomies got pushed out to once every four months. Now that statistically was significant. Right, and nothing else changed. You didn't like start a new exercise, yoga, breathing, green juice, not, nothing else. Just like, this is my life, and now I'm adding this. Yeah. yeah. So uh, when I went back in, my biggest fear was I was gonna have some liver toxicity just from eating algae. You know, I, I just didn't know what the biological effect was going to be of eating that. Because some algaes produce different uh, um, cytotoxins and things like that, yeah. So, um, but I would go in, get my blood work checked, and my I noticed my A1C was running about 6.2. My A1C came back down into the fives, and I didn't change anything. I didn't change any habits, nothing. My blood work became quite normal. But at 12 milligrams, I was now being... Uh, phlebotomized when my hemoglobin got up around 19, I would go in and, and they would, they would kick me back. Um, so then I had two slopes of the curve. I had at four milligrams, I was phlebotomized once every two months. At 12 milligrams, now I'm phlebotomized every four months. So I had two different slopes of the curve. So I could take those slopes and calculate how much do I have to take so that I'm never phlebotomized for the next 50 years of my life. Oh, interesting, right. And that's where the math side, it was just a mathematical game to play. And it came out to be 96 milligrams a day. So I started taking 100 and my phlebotomies ended. I no longer had to climb out my hemoglobin normalized between 13 and 17. I had no excursions um, and everything changed. So then I knew that this is the only thing that could have done it. And so then I thought, well, I'm gonna be clever and I'm just going to, because I got tired of eating that much algae and growing it, which was a hassle. So now they had it on the marketplace where I could go to Walmart and buy the astaxanthin. So when I switched from eating the astaxanthin, the biomass to the oil, my phlebotomies came back. Oh, and this is, this is the pure astaxanthin that's just in a base of fish oil or some other type of 
manufacturing oil, a food oil, and that didn't work as well. Hmm. Yeah, I began to have a problem and it came back. So I just kept increasing the dose, thinking that through a concentration gradient, I could just increase the concentration, keep pushing it into the into the biological membranes, and maybe it would work just by taking that material. And I got well over 800 milligrams before my phlebotomies turned, it came the other direction. So where I was taking 100 of the, that was in the biomass, I'm now well over 800 milligrams by using the pure astaxanthin. That was a game changer. So now I knew what is different in the biomass. What is different there? It took me eight years to figure it out versus what was in the oil. And when we did a mass spec, we found that it's glucosidic. Astaxanthin is what the algae produces. So the glucosidic astaxanthin is actually the natural supplement. It's in the extraction process that we denature it. So all I did through organic chemistry, I knew how to attach electromagnetically that glucose back onto that astaxanthin. It's called a glucosidic reaction. And it's, it's textbook type stuff. And it's so valuable. And interestingly, I had to have a conversation with Tommy about this because I had some clients that, you know, they have very surface knowledge of any of this stuff compared to you. Everybody has surface knowledge of any of this stuff, you know, and, uh, you know, they saw that the new labels on Velasta had glucose listed. And they were like, Mike, the sugar in here, I'm trying to stay away from sugar. And I, and I said, I'm sure there's a, I, I actually suspected that it had to do with delivery because um, there's a practice in holistic health. And I don't know very much about its effectiveness, but they, there's people that uh, put turpentine on sugar cubes because they want to pair it with the, they want to pair it with the sugar so the cells will take it up more effectively. And they do this to kill yeast and to, to kill cancer. For everybody listening, I have no idea if that works. This is just something clients told me about. But I I'd understood this process of pairing things with glucose so it would be more readily brought into the cell, you know, the Trojan horse, as you called it. So, um, so yeah, so it's interesting. i got to so tell you a little bit of, of anecdotal. When I was a young child, uh, to keep us from getting worms, they would give us turpentine on sugar cubes. Oh, they did. Oh, that's probably where it came from. Yeah. This goes yeah, back in the 50s, the 40s, the 50s, the 60s. Uh, wow. th that was a standard treatment for kids. I don't recommend it, but that's what they gave us kids to keep us from getting getting pinworms from playing in the dirt. Wow. Yeah. When my clients started telling me about that, a couple of them did. Like This is over 15 years ago. It started coming up and I went... I get that intellectually what you're telling me. I said, but there has to be, and I know turpentine is not as, um, uh, it's actually not as um, chemical as one would think. When you hear the word turpentine, the way it smells. Yeah, it's not reactive. Um, but I said that there has to be some layover of toxicity or on the liver or something when you're drinking turpentine or even in small doses. So I was like, I don't know if I would do that, but I don't know that much about it. I, I don't recommend it either, but the turpentine isn't readily absorbed through the small bowel. It actually kills the parasite in situ. That's, oh. that's, it moves through your, through your bowel system and creates a pretty substantial inflammatory response. It's not so much turpentine is one of those almost inert organic compounds that it just moves through your gut and kills everything uh, that's living in your gut at that time. Typically it's parasites. Yeah, probably not great for the microbiome either. So the, the sugar cube, the sugar cube was the Trojan horse for the child, <laughs> just to get the child to take the tur turpentine. But, but once we have that glucose attached, um, it, it made all the difference in the world. So anybody that's comparing Velasta to the Walmart brand, we're essentially the same price on a dollars per milligram point of view, but you've got to take eight times more of that to get the same effect that you get from the glucosidic form of the astaxanthin. That was the game changer. I'm glad we covered that because that was one of the, the major areas of complaint in the comment section was like, oh, it's so expensive. It's so expensive. It's so... And I thought I wanted to I wanted to say, like, listen, like, I don't know what 
you expect, but when we're, we're, we're talking about algae extractions in its most potent form, and, and like, like, I don't know why people think that's necessarily such a cheap thing to do. <laughs> I was like, I'm sure that the pro- It's not. It is, it is difficult, but they need to c- compare apples and apples. Compare it on dollars per milligram of astaxanthin. That's what that's what the, that's what it has to be. And the fact now that if, if they want to go use the Walmart stuff, that's fine. If they use it at the same dose as Velasta, they won't see any effect. Well, I took my response to everyone in the comment section. I said, listen, if you have any ideas on how to produce this more cost effectively, I'm sure that they would love to know. So just send them a message. Yeah, it's not easy. So at some point then you received um, clearance from your doctor. I mean, you must have gone back to your doctor and they said, hey, Sam, we looked at everything and you are clear now. And in 2015, I was declared cancer free. They couldn't figure it out. I was the only known cure of polycythemia vera on the planet. This was uh, 12 years after I was diagnosed. Were they interested in any of the things you had to report or were they just like, gonna, did they just write it off on a piece of paper? Like, well, spontaneous uh, remission here and, you know. Yep, natural remission. They had no explanation for it. But uh, since then, we now know, and it's coming out, 68% of all deaths, all deaths in the U.S., the NIH just reported this last week, uh, is caused by inflammation. So the gig's up. They're going to start admitting how important inflammation is to the general health of human beings. We've just now got the ability to manage it. The reason they stopped running the C-reactive protein test, it used to be part of our blood work up until about 12, 15 years ago. And they stopped running it because they saw everybody was in an inflamed state, but they didn't have any way to treat because it's not, inflammation is not a disease. Right. It's a condition. It's a condition, but it's also good and bad. There's, there's two, two sides to that sword. Uh, if you have to have some inflammation through interleukin six to um, cause an attack on a foreign microbe or a for, or, or a virus or some other issue, that's good inflammation. Right. Even muscle growth requires some inflammation. You know. Uh, for example, people getting stem cell uh, transplants now. Stem cells require inflammation. They require the stem cells to be agitated to the point that they can grow and start growing into the cells they're supposed to grow into. So they ask everybody to stop taking antioxidants for that reason. They don't want to suppress the growth of it. Now there's two sides. In engineering, we have an equation called in minus out equals accumulation. So that's a very standard equation, whether it's mass or energy, but in in inflammation, the generation of inflammation minus the rate at which you get rid of that inflammation equals your accumulation that causes disease. Accumulation causes disease. So if you're generating a lot of free radicals and you're not taking any out, your accumulation term is going to get very large. It's like filling up a water balloon. And eventually it's going to present in a disease. And it's specific to the individual. Each person presents differently and responds differently to that net water balloon full of uh, free radicals. Now, what Velasta does is I can decrease the rate. And and this is where Fred Bishi is so important. Fred Bishi can decrease the rate of inflammation. As a as your diet, there's certain things that you should not eat that are inflammatory. Fructose is one of those. Fructose can't be used by a single cell in your body, not one. It's classified by the CDC as a chronic poison because it cannot be used at all. So if you can decrease those inflammatory things out of your diet and increase the rate at which you can get rid of them through antioxidants, through vegetables, um, um, and I'm, I'm going to explain a little bit about that too. Um, you can all of a sudden begin to decrease the size of the water balloon. You decrease your uh, inflammatory disease state. Up until age 50 in men, 
you're producing enough glutathione and SOD, superoxide dismutase, to neutralize the inflammatory response from your bad habits. That's why when we're 20 years old, we can do a lot of weird stuff. We could drink a lot of beer. I could eat a lot of sugar. I could stay up late. I could chase women. I could stress myself to the max because I had glutathione being produced. At the average age of 42 in women and age 50 in men, the, glu here, the glutathione level um, drops off dramatically. And this is why we get age onset disease. We know we lose our rate at which we can get rid of those free radicals. It's interesting that you say that because um, now, and I live a, I live a diet. I, I eat a diet rich in antioxidants. And I do a lot of cleansing practices. But now that I'm 48, um, you know, if, if I if I get a few hours less sleep for too many nights in a row, I feel it. Where I used to I used to live off of four hours of sleep when, and work myself silly when I was in my 20s. Yeah. And now, oh my God, if I, if I don't sleep right. I don't know if you can see this or not. I can, yeah, yeah. This red line here, mm -hmm. this is a measure of your glutathione production by age. I took blood samples from age five years old up to 105. And I looked at the glutathione level in their red blood cells. It looks like it increases at some point. Is that right? Out here. At 80, the, these people that I took the samples from had higher levels of glutathione. That's why they were allowed to live longer. I see. Okay. Fred Bishi is going to, he's still producing glutathione. I'm um, sure. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, he's, he... he's still producing or he's eating such high levels of antioxidants. Th that he's operating in this range. Up here at 105, they had the same glutathione level as somebody who was 50 years old. Yeah, look at that. This is what was, was working. This curve here is the C-reactive protein, the measure of your inflammatory disease state. Most people die in this range right here. When your glutathione production is the lowest, but your the bad habits you generated early on in your life that you got away with are now catching up to you. Right. And your your ability to detoxify too. I see people here at my on my unit, the bowels slow down, like every all the systems are slowing down too at that point. This is the simplest process to show how age onset disease eventually kills people. It's so simple too. It's it's fantastic. That chart is amazing right there. Yeah. And now when you give people Velasta and you increase the antioxidant effect, decrease the CRP, now you don't get these diseases that's going to kill you. Yeah, now you're reversing aging. You're reversed aging. And now the NIH is now publishing reports since we came out with this. They're now publishing reports about how important it is to use astaxanthin to stop the aging process and the onset of age-related diseases. That was the key. And back here, when we're 20, you know, in our teens and 20s, we can do a lot of stupid things and get away with it because look how high our glutathione, we, we have a natural pro uh, uh, protection. Well, I, luckily I stopped all of my bad behaviors, most of my bad behaviors by 19. And I got really into this in a deep way. And that's why I ended up being a colon hydrotherapist for 22 years and working in holistic health. Um, but it looks like I found supplementally Velasta at the right time because I'm almost 50 years old. So, yep, that that's exactly right. And, and the, 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 the sad part is, um, you can't take glutathione orally. And um, the reason is the stomach acid uh, completely obliterates it. Um, glutathione typically is only produced at the cellular level using leucine or isoleucine amino acids. And it's only done there. So just having those amino acids present, if the pathway has been damaged, which stress does, you can't produce glutathione. And we, we, we seem to think that's why the glutathione production drops off so dramatically. It's not that you're missing those amino acids. It's that the pathway 
to convert isoleucine into glutathione um, no longer exists. It's nature's way of taking us out. Um, we've always done this with diet and lifestyle. And I think that's why, you know, Dr. Bishi has done so well for so many years. I just saw him in New York, uh, um, I guess about five, six weeks ago now. And he said, he goes aside, he has a little complication from a back surgery he had. He goes, aside from that, he goes, I feel like I'm 50 years old still. He goes, I just got to get this, this back situation. I'm so pleased with how he, he, he truly was a pioneer early on with this. Yeah. He knew the antioxidant content. Now he's a raw vegan, but he he knew the importance of those antioxidants. And um he eats so much of them that um he's getting more than his fair share. But normal human beings, and he'd be the first first to tell us this is not a lifestyle. His lifestyle is not for everybody. It's his lifestyle's tough social ramifications just you know it's actually quite simple but when you work through food cravings social ramifications and you know i i eat very similar to him actually and uh you know luckily you know you have to marry the right person and and, and you know just just that they understand who you are and they they get it and they appreciate it yeah now i had i don't i don't live to, live to it i've taken fruit out of my diet completely um but this is what got dr kais so enthralled in looking at my heart, and my arteries, I think, was when I told him, he said, what's your diet consist of? I said, well, for the last 40 years, I wake up every morning and I have uh, bacon and eggs. And he just threw his head back. <laughs> he said, you what? I said, yeah. I said, I, I, I have bacon every morning. This is the interesting part about you. This is the interesting part. I've talked about this with Dr. Bishy because, uh, you know, he told me originally, he said, Mike, he goes, when I first heard about this Velasta stuff and asked his anthem, he goes, you know, he goes, I thought it was just another new thing. You know, this, there's been so many over the past 50 years for him, over the past 30 years for me. Um, some of them, very few of them stick. Some, most of them fall away as just fads. And he goes, I didn't, he goes, I didn't know. He said, but then he goes, I had clients that weren't working the diet that he put them on all that well some of them weren't really doing it at all but they were getting tremendous results you know um that's how powerful it is so i'm sorry i interrupted you but uh but you're yeah so so that's what so i think sparked his interest was oh my golly i need to look in your arteries and in your heart you know you know you could be on the verge of having a major heart attack after that kind of a diet <laughs> and I, right. he he uh he, he was beginning to put fear in, in my life was, oh, my golly, maybe I've only got a couple of weeks left. But but when we got in there and he, he began to look, he was amazed. But my cholesterol is very, very low. Um, it typically runs 150. It, it really doesn't matter. Now, Tommy's cholesterol runs 240. Doesn't matter. It's it's in stopping that plate, that plaque formation. And now we're seeing the same thing with amyloid plaque in the brain for Alzheimer's. We know that the, what causes that to form is that is the misfolding of the amyloid protein caused by its interaction with the hydroxyl free radical. If that hydroxyl free radical touches that amyloid protein, instead of it being a watered up piece of paper, which is the way it's supposed to be, it unfolds. And it plaques layer upon layer. It looks like pancakes and finally wraps around the neuron. And that's what causes Alzheimer's. So the foundation to, mo to many of these diseases, inflammatory diseases, is basically the havoc that these free radicals are wreaking across the system. And Velasta neutralizes all of them very quickly and effectively. That's correct. I, and, and this is textbook stuff. I taught this at North Harris Community College. It's now Lone Star College in Texas. I taught biochemistry. And there were pre-med doctors taking the course. And they, um, so they're all taught this. This is not, you don't have to believe a thing I'm saying. Just go look at the textbooks. So this has all been known. All I did that was out of necessity, compiled it into an understandable form and made it available to the layperson. That's, that's my legacy. That's all I've done. It must have been very easy for a doctor to forget coming out of school because you have all of these patients that 
it's so hard to control the variables of what they're eating, their stress levels, what they're doing to even, um, you know, their, their various ages, like to even to, to, to maximize their own endogenous antioxidants or how they're going to intake antioxidants or how they're going to create their own free radicals that they just go, well, it's probably a lot easier to just work on everybody's symptoms because, you know, astaxanthin wasn't around probably when these people graduated school. So they were like, what are we going to all do? Become nutritionists and get them on, you know, it's like, it, it's a much, it, it's much easier probably for a doctor to just be symptom focused. They started out treating inflammation with 81 milligrams of aspirin. That was a big thing back. It still is. It, it, it is an anti-inflammatory. But no doctor it sees at a high level of inflammation and they're going to prescribe steroids because that's the, that's the medication that they would give you. Well, that's not acceptable in, in the medical community to put somebody on chronic steroids for simple inflammation. So now... When doctors are only going to treat the symptoms, there's not a lot of interest in trying to find the root cause. Now, the root cause of inflammatory disease, we've been able to narrow down to five free radicals. Velasta neutralizes all five of those, by the way. There's the RNS, which is the, nit the nitrogen form free radical, nitrile. Then there's superoxide, singlet oxygen, peroxyl, and the hydroxyl free radical. Velasta neutralizes all of those by simply donating an electron and neutralizing those free radicals. Without any side effect from that point on. That's one of the nice things about using natural form of, uh, of, of astaxanthin than the synthetic form. Synthetic form doesn't work. And there's a very understandable organic chemistry reason why. All living things, this is why we have to eat living things, all living things produce what's called left-handed molecules. Our bodies can only use left-handed molecules. Right-handed molecules create terrible side effects. What, what makes them, what defines that left and, left and right-handed? Like what would that, what's the difference in that? You what's just held it up there. That? Same number of fingers, same thumb, Right. They're okay. opposites. Oh, so they're just they're just um, uh, structured in the wrong way. Yeah, their three dimensional structure is wrong. So when this one's pointing down, this one's pointing up. They're called it's called chirality. Thalidomide in the forties, fifties, and sixties. Um, it was a chemically um, produced organic molecule. The left handed molecule. The the, 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 the thalidomide itself was produced to stop morning sickness in women. Right. Okay, so when they gave it to pregnant women, their children, their, the babies that were born, were born with no arms and no legs. That's right. Now I remember. Yes. Well, when we got into it in chirality, and we studied it in the 70s extensively, because we would make it, it when we make an organic molecule in the laboratory, okay. we make... 50% left-handed and 50% thereabouts right-handed molecules. We can't, we can't just produce left-handed molecules. It's a statistical aberration. So nature says 50% of the time I'm going to make a left-handed molecule. Other 50% of the time I'm going to make a right-handed molecule. We can never make synthetically in the laboratory a pure left-handed molecule. Only living things can make left-handed molecules. That's why we have to eat food. Now, it's probably never been explained this way to anyone, but that's the reality of what we see. So when they went in and they began producing thalidomide in the laboratory, guess what? They made both left-handed and right-handed molecules. Well, the left-handed molecule lines up beautifully to react with enzymes in the body. The right-handed molecule, especially on a growing stem cell of an arm, terminates the growth because you have a left-handed molecule attaching to a right-handed molecule. Now the right-handed molecule cannot attach to a left-handed molecule. It terminates it. And now we end up with all these children with no arms and no legs, but it was all done. So whenever we make a prescription drug Let's say we make an antibiotic in the laboratory. 
We make both, the left hand and right hand molecule. Only the left handed molecule is going to work. The right hand molecule has to be assimilated in your liver, and this is what causes liver damage. Mm. And en enzymatic action has to tear it apart, which is a high energy uh, component generating a lot of free radicals to do that, just to get rid of that. That's called liver toxicity. And now you've got the side effects. You have uh, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease that'll form from large dose of, uh, let's say, synthetic vitamin C versus natural vitamin C. Now you've got a problem. Natural vitamin C will work because it's only a left-handed molecule. That's one of the best explanations as to how synthetic versus natural works. I think people are going to learn a lot from that because, you know, because we know in the natural health world to avoid a lot of synthetic things. But uh, I, I don't think it's ever been it's never been explained like that to me. These were these were all things that I had to explain at a student level because it, it, it's a concept when you just look at organic chemistry. And, and they throw these up. It's hard to visualize what effect these things are having when you take them. The pharmaceutical company won't separate a left-handed molecule from a right-handed molecule because it's not cost-effective. Let me give you an example. Um, Keytruda, which is a cancer drug. When they make Keytruda, the antigen, they make both a left-handed and a right-handed amino acids that go into that. Well, it turns out that to separate those is 0.18 degrees centigrade difference in the crystallization temperature. We, they can't control the temperature well enough to have one drop out of solution and leave the other. So they just say, okay, you just take this chemo drug and we'll deal with the side effects later. So they just manage the trail of disaster that can potentially happen depending on what they're doing. Wow, that's interesting. So yeah, so like if they're taking something from like rainforest plants or something, you know, and now they're trying to synthesize it into a drug, the natural version would probably either have no side effects or have less side effects. And then the, but the synthetic version creates all of this complication now. But there's, Keytruda is a good, good example. Keytruda and Optiva were both developed from work with astaxanthin. I've got the research papers. I know the researchers who did the work on stopping glioblastoma and pancreatic cancer in dogs and monkeys. They now work for a pharmaceutical companies. Well, when I contacted them, I asked them if they were working on astaxanthin and they both of them said, no, 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 we're not allowed to work on natural supplements. We have to work on a molecule that mimics the activities of astaxanthin, but we have to make it chemically. They made Keytruda and Opdivo from the work that was done as a PD-L1 or PD-1 inhibitor that astaxanthin does. And the reason is there's no money in a natural substance. Now they can patent the oh, Keytruda yeah. and Opdivo. That's what the game is about. And right. the, if we can find the natural substances and we can cost effectively extract them, um, it's real easy to go get a, a drug out of the Amazon that's growing in the bark of some tree, be able to identify it, and from a molecular point of view. And it's easier to take that molecule and figure out the chemistry to produce it than it is to go harvest all the bark off of that tree, boil it down, crystallize it without changing its effect, to get to get that when you can very simply make it in a nice sterile laboratory. Um, they always talk about the death of the rainforest being so tragic because of so many, you know, maybe there's certain cures for different things that could still be found there. But um, basically what you're saying is that no matter what they find in the rainforest, if it's not being extracted in its natural form, it's probably most likely going to have some type of trail of disaster that needs management after that. That's why, that's why the algae product really got my attention was because, um, for example, to get a harvest of corn on one acre of growing corn takes 181 days. With algae, I, I double the biomass with algae, with hematococcus, every three days. That's how fast algae grows. So it's the fastest growing plant on the planet. 
So we technically can produce this. We're not growing trees. Trees take a long time. But algae is so important in the concept of the nutraceutical side because of its rapid ability to grow, to capture CO2, to use up all of the nitrates and phosphate pollutants that's currently in our river water. Al algae has so many um, opportunities. It's, it's uh, DARPA looked at it. it we, we worked on it for three years just to make a JP8. Now, now, let me give you an example of why we were looking at algae to generate oil that we could convert into jet fuel. When we get um, jet fuel from a refinery, from, from fossil fuels, crude oil, we have, we have both. We have right-hand and left-handed molecules in that fossil fuel, and it goes to a refinery. Now, when we make a jet fuel, the gel point of that jet fuel is minus 40 degrees centigrade. What that means is that if I lowered the temperature of the jet fuel to minus 40, it would turn into a gel, almost like a solid or a wax. So that's called the gel point. Well, unbeknownst to us at the time we were doing on this, I didn't know what aircraft that we were designing a fuel for, but our fuel had to uh, have a gel point of minus 56 degrees centigrade. So if it's minus 56, I knew there was an aircraft that was going to fly in excess of 120,000 feet. We, didn't, we weren't told what the aircraft was. Nobody wanted to talk about it. Now we know. In 2013, uh, we were told what aircraft that was. But What kind of aircraft was that? Can you talk about that? Yeah, it was called the Aurora. It's public knowledge now. Okay, I'll look that up after this. Maybe I'll even drop a link to an article on that or something in the show notes. Yeah, it's a... Uh, but, but we had to have, and the only way we could get that fuel was only using left-handed fatty acids. And only living things produce 100% left-handed fatty acids, and algae was one of those. So they needed a fuel that would gel at minus 56 degrees centigrade. We knew that fossil fuels coming out of refineries without major additives, we couldn't achieve that. But the reason it was, was the chirality of the fatty acid we had to get rid of the right-hand molecule. It's very, very difficult to separate the three-dimensional uh, shape of any organic molecule. That is not an easy thing to do in a chemistry lab. And you're doing this with volume too. You're doing this with either temperature or adding different substances or something to get these things to drop away from the solution somehow? Yeah, let, let me give you an example. The, the crystallization temperature of two organic molecules, they're, they're both sitting in a beaker. We lower the temperature very, very low. And then a car drives by and shakes the building. That's enough energy to elevate that totally out of control to elevate that temperature cycle and stop that crystallization. A simple vibration can impart enough that you cannot separate those two. We, um, it, it's not economical. It's better to deal with the side effects and human death than it is to try to separate and eliminate all the side effects from, from drugs. Were you able to do it with that fuel at the volume you, they probably needed for their, their ship? I imagine there was a big budget for this. The reason is we knew that algae grew so fast. We had an algae that doubled every eight hours. We would get a, get a doubling of the biomass every eight hours. So we could technically generate enough oil. Now the oil, the, the fatty acid content in those algaes, there's one called Neochlorus oleoabundans we looked at that was upwards of about 70% of its weight was fatty acids. Um, and we could extract it very, very easily. Um, um, fish oil, for example, doesn't come from fish. Fish oil only comes from algae. Uh, algae produces the, the fish oil, the fish, the, oh. the, the yeah, the phytoplankton, it's a, it's a food chain accumulation that it ends up in the pogey fish and, or pierogi fish or whatever they are. Right. I actually take algae oil supplementally. I take it for essential fatty acids because I don't eat fish. So that's that's the original form of fatty acids is all algae. There's no fish that produces fish oil. 
Oh, this is a great question. You just you just reminded me of a question. I don't want us to miss this one because so many people were curious about this. In regards to the food chain, how is astaxanthin moving up the food chain? To, like it makes sense with sharks or something like that, or it makes sense where algaes are moving, especially a saltwater algae is moving through you know aquatic animals, even flamingos that might be eating fish or things that or, or, or crustaceans that might have a concentration of it. But how is it getting into mole rats and elephants? Do you have any idea? Yeah, it's a great question. I asked the same question was why, why are elephants? Um, elephants are, are strapped, they'll drink water from anywhere. So what happens when they're traveling through, through the desert or wherever, they come up on a water, a, a water pond. A lot of nutrients are in there. A lot of animals have crapped in the water. There's, it's high nutrient content, high nitrogen, high phosphorus. A temperature is high, a lot of sunlight, and guess what? You have a lot of algae growth. Well, that's a very stressful uh, uh, algae uh, growing medium. Hematococcus is one of those that grows in that medium. Oh, because of the evaporation and the algae constantly adapting to the to the change in pH or the change in salinity or something. Or yep. So every time an elephant would put its trunk in there to drink that water, all the algae ends up in his stomach. The same as me eating the biomass. Oh, that's interesting. Okay, yeah, because everyone was thinking they were like, "How do how on earth is this getting into these animals that are land animals?" Pink flamingos do the same thing. Pink flamingos sift the protozoa that's eating the algae out of the water. You see their little beaks going back and forth like this. It's not so much they're eating fish; they're eating the protozoa that eat the algae and bioaccumulate the astaxanthin in the protozoa. So that's how they get pink. The mole rats, the best we can figure out with mole rats is they're picking it up because they eat the roots of the grass. Now, we think now that it's a fungus that's growing on the, down in the roots in the soil that the mole rats are picking up. And there's actually a name of the fungus that produces astaxanthin. Well, I want to get to, I think we actually answered a lot of the questions just in, in by the nature of our conversation. But um, I want to just make sure I get to a couple of them here. Regarding dosage, is there any guidelines on dosage? Like how much, I mean, you, you, have, you have it at your disposal. You have as much as you'd like. How much do you, how much do you and Tommy take? I take 100 milligrams a day. She, Tommy takes 120 milligrams a day. Now, 100 milligrams a day, that is, um, what does that look like in regards to capsules for somebody buying one of the pumps? That would be equivalent to about uh, nine, nine pumps. Oh, nine pumps a day. Okay. Yeah, so I take about 10 pumps a day because I, I put, I, I, I fit about five, maybe four and a half, 4.5 into a capsule. Okay, so that makes sense. Typically, what we looked at is, when we started out, it, and this goes back into, into basic pharmacology about how, how to determine dosing. We wanted to look at how many cells are actually in the human body. We wanted every cell covered with a molecule of astaxanthin. Now in one mole of astaxanthin, there's 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd molecules. So astaxanthin, I think, has a molecular weight of 400 uh, or thereabouts. I'll have to look it up again. But uh, so in 400 grams, one pound of astaxanthin, there's six with 23 zeros molecules of astaxanthin. So you can calculate, we have maybe Oh, we might have a trillion human cells, but not all of those are, are human. Probably half of them are. But, but let's say we have 10 to the eighth cells in our body. And we want one molecule per cell. So that means we only need 10 to the eighth. Well, in 400 grams, there's 10 to the 23rd. So I'm just 10 to the 15th less type of, of 400. So there's a calculation you can use. It doesn't take much of a medicine 
to cover every single cell in your body, even though you have maybe a trillion cells. And only half of those, by the way, contain your DNA. And that's a, and that's a great maintenance dose. Is there any uh, is there anything advantageous to taking um, higher dosages, or does it just become excess at that point for an adult? Let's say. Yeah, there's two things that we look at. If you're doing it as a preventative, we want to do it until you reach spillover, because every individual is, is different. And what I ref mean by spillover. We want to see a little bit pass through your colon. I want a little bit of red. Don't send me pictures of your stool. They do that. They do that to me, Sam. You should see the things people have texted me over the years. Uh, Michael, we're, we're, yeah, that's just not that just shouldn't happen. But but anyways, um, so, so we want a little bit of spill over, just to make sure that your body's absorbing as much of it as you at, as it can. Now, in a disease state, there's two mechanisms at which we can get it into the biology of the diseased person. The first one is through enzymatic action in the small bowel. So the astaxanthin shows up, it's absorbed right through the epithelial cells or the cilia of the small bowel. And and there's little enzymes that'll actually pick it up and, and take it into the blood, into the capillaries. The second one is what's called concentration gradient. If I increase the concentration high enough by brute force, I can force it through the cell membrane just from what's called concentration gradient or diffusion. Right. So there, there's two mechanisms. So <clears throat> we prefer staying in equilibrium with your with your enzyme level. But in some cases, their immune system is so debilitated that those enzymes don't exist and they can take the astaxanthin and they will not get it in. At those points, then we wanna push it pretty hard. And that's what the National Institute of Health is seeing in all their research papers, massive doses of astaxanthin to force it into the mice uh, cell, cellular membrane. But they're not using the glucosidic form either. How would somebody, uh, let's say someone is experiencing something and they're trying to figure out how much they should take. You, uh, do you still have a resource or an email or something where people can get advice? The, uh, the actual telephone number is 803-470-1913. But I would prefer that they email through, uh, I think it's info at velasta.net. And then we have nurses on staff that will be able to, to get back to them. Typically... When we started out, I started them out on one milligram per kilogram of body weight per day. So uh, if you take your weight, divide it by two. So let's say you weigh 200 pounds, divide it by two, that's 100. Start out at 100 milligrams per day. See if your stool turns red and see the first thing that people notice is the pain in their fingers when they wake up, go away. That's what I that's what I noticed. I noticed that, you know, I was like, oh, I'm really loose today, you know, and I was like, yeah, that was the first thing that I noticed also when I started doing the glucosidic form was, oh, my golly, I, I, I don't have any arthritis. I'm I, my, my energy level was sky high when you're not wasting energy fighting inflammation. Your energy level kicks. You get a boost. Don't be wasting the energy that your body is trying to generate through the mitochondria. Um, so a, a lot of people see this, this bump up in energy when they're not focused on their pain. And how about for, uh, what, what about age-related dosages? This is something um, safe for children, toddlers, infants, or should people just wait until they're old enough to, to be an adult to take this? We have, um, we have children with cancer that are taking it. And the doctors are amazed that the progression of their cancer is stopping. That makes me so happy. That was probably the best news that I had in, in the entire discovery was all of a sudden, and St. Jude's pretty much, much told me no pound salt that they, you probably want to cut that out, but um, they had no interest in this unless it's recommended yeah. by a doctor. So, right. but, but children have taken it. And it, it's, 
people have got to understand and, and use the information and use their best ability to um, coalesce that information into the dose. So if they, there, there's no harm in this. The NIH has, uh, has found out also that there's no side effects other than a red stool. And red lipstick. And red lipstick too. And, <laughs> and, and you don't want to get it on you. The first time I the first time I had it, Sam, I took it and I just shot it. In my I said, okay, this stuff came that that Fred recommended. Let me just I shot it in my mouth. I just wanted to get a taste of it and see. Licked my lips, didn't know it, and then I say, okay, let's um let's go. We were going to Costco, and my wife looks at me and she goes, you can't go to Costco in Southern Oregon with red lipstick on. Like what? what? She goes, go wash that off your lips. I was like, wait, what? What? I, was, I didn't realize it. It wipes off actually if you rub it hard enough, but. You know, and a drop goes so far. I've added, added it on my fingertip, and then I thought, well, you know, I'll, I'll wash it off. And pretty soon I see it on the wall. I see it on my forehead. It's on my ear. Everywhere. It's everywhere. It, it, it's so electrostatic that um, it sticks. It, it'll actually get into the fingerprint of your finger. Yeah. And it's, it's difficult to get out. I want you to talk about the, um, taking it with drugs for blood thinning and diabetes. Oh yeah, this is a great point. Um, one of the, the things we did, it, it doesn't work on type one diabetics other than they'll see a little drop in their insulin resistance, but it's not gonna stop the, the type one diabetic disease. Type two diabetes is a whole other question. So people with type two diabetes are usually taking metformin or insulin or they're getting a shot. And that keeps their blood levels sort of at a normal level. Now, when you take Velasta, your insulin resistance will go away. Now, what that will result in is if you're taking the same level of medication, you'll see your blood sugars get lower and lower and lower. Great point. Interesting. Yeah. The doctors tell you to take your blood sugars first thing when you get up in the morning. That's because that's where it's the highest. The best time to take your blood sugars for a realistic uh, normal blood sugar is 30 minutes before you eat lunch. That's your ideal blood sugar. The reason is, is what's called a dawn phenomenon. And everybody wakes up about four o'clock in the morning, between three and five. Everybody on the planet wakes up. And there's a reason. There's a, there's a biomechanical reason why that happens. And you've gone from your last meal for probably eight or nine hours till you hit about four o'clock in the morning um, without any food. So your blood sugar levels drop. Well, when your blood sugar levels drop, your liver will start converting glycogen into glucose. That sugar spike wakes your brain up and you get a lot more electrical activity because of the, the metabolism. Well, most people get up at four o'clock, they go pee or they get into a light dream sleep, but it's because of, of that. Well, it'll keep producing glucose until you have enough sugar to activate your muscles so you can wake up in the morning. That's why the blood sugar level is so high in the mornings. It's not, a, it's, it, it's not truly indicative of what your normal blood sugar is going to be. But with Velasta, if you're taking meds and you're taking Velasta, your blood sugar levels 30 minutes before you eat lunch is going to start dropping. It's going to force you to cut back on your insulin medication until finally after 30 to 60 days, you'll be completely off of your meds. So someone has to be very aware of that. They have to be aware of that. The same thing with heparin or warfarin or blood thinners because you don't give warfarin or heparin to people who have normal clotting factors. Right. Well, Velasta will normalize those clotting factors. Now, all of a sudden your blood's too thin. You've got to get off of those meds. So it's something that you have to watch. You got to look at your sed rate. You got to, you know, look at some of your, your clotting factors. And it's something you have to monitor because Velasta is going to normalize your blood, your blood work. And you don't give insulin 
to people that aren't diabetics and you don't give blood thinner to people that don't have a clotting problem. And I imagine this applies probably in a variety of different drug interactions that have probably yet to even be observed, right? Yeah, yeah, there's not much. Um, cholesterol, for example, might be one, but it's like uh, uh, Dr. Keiss mentioned that uh, statins are still a pretty good drug. As a cardiologist, I think he still takes statins, but um, it, it, it has some other benefits he, that he gets, but I'm on, I'm on nothing. I don't have any, any real disease. I don't have arthritis. I'm 70 years old. Um, I, I, I actually run, I go out and I cut logs. I, I, I do lumberjacking. I, I'm, I'm amazed, to be honest with you. Um, I wanted to tell you a quick story. You know, I was very excited and happy because I have three children. I have a two and a half year old. I have one on the way and I have a 32 year old. So we're, we're an interesting family. But my 32 year old son had bowel cancer. And, um, you know, when I, we live on different coasts now, but when I saw him uh, just a few months ago when I was uh, in New York, um, he showed up at, we went to a family wedding and uh, he showed up and he had a bottle of Velasta. <laughs> <laughs> oh, interesting. Very good. Yeah. I was very happy. He's cancer free now. You know, he went a very traditional route, but he also changed his diet and cleaned up some things in his life and did really well with that. And now he's taking Velasta. And his girlfriend was like, Mike, this stuff is incredible. She goes, I've had chronic back pain for so long. And like, so they're both on it and they're both taking it. I was too afraid to take it on my trip because I was afraid they were going to uh, confiscate it from my um, <laughs> from my luggage uh, from a carry on. And uh, I was like, I don't want to see a $250 bottle disappear appear because I can't get on a plane. So, so I didn't take it. I was a little nervous about that. I, uh, I've, I, I've noticed that I sort of experiment. I, I'll go three days, four days without taking it. Not and, on and, uh, yes, uh, most of the time not on purpose, but I either forgot it or, but when I wake up in the morning, I'm in trouble. My ankles, my knees, my shoulders, uh, even through the night, I'll start getting aches and pains. But within 24 hours of coming back on it, it, it goes away. With regard I, to, I, I'm amazed. With regard to his son, he, uh, traditional uh, chemotherapy and stuff, this will help them even if they've had uh, traditional. Yeah. So speak to that. Yeah, uh, uh, good point. Um, he obviously is going to watch his high sensitivity C-reactive protein and um, make sure that that number is under three. That'll, that'll really decrease the probability of this ever coming back. Because um, now, now that he's had chemo and, and probably some radiation, uh, did he have surgery or was it? He had, he had surgery. Yes. Okay. And did they follow up with chemo? I'm trying to remember if they did just radiation or chemo. I, I don't recall exactly what they followed up with. I have all the paperwork. It was a number of years ago now, but uh, I'm not sure. I don't recall. With, with cancer, and this is one of the problems I have with chemo, chemo and radiation both are extremely inflammatory. The whole idea is to go in with a shotgun blast, kill the DNA in the cancer cell, but they're also going to kill the DNA in normal cells or mutate, cause damage to the DNA in normal cells that in one to five years, a very high probability, about 87% chance that they're gonna represent with cancer from the chemo or radiation caused the cancer. Now, right. in cancer, oftentimes uh, in cancer cells, there's one DNA repair mechanism. It's called PARP. P-A-R-P. There's three um, re DNA repair mechanisms, BRCA1, BRCA2, and PARP. Normal cells have all three, typically, all three repair mechanisms. Some people are negative on those. And they're highly susceptible that when their DNA gets mutated, they have a much higher probability of presenting with cancer because it, it, they can't get their DNA repaired. That's called BRCA1, BRCA2, or PARP, triple negative type of uh, cancers. Now, with, with cancer cells, they only have one repair mechanism. Typically, it's called PARP. They don't have BRCA1 and BRCA2. 
So if they give you chemo, oftentimes they'll give you what's called a PARP inhibitor, which shuts down the PARP in every cell in your body, not just the cancer cell. It'll shut the PARP down in a normal cell. Hopefully, in a normal cell, you have BRCA1 and BRCA2 that's going to repair the DNA when the PARP is shut down. In cancer cells, they don't have that luxury. So with, mm -hmm. when the chemo and the radiation damages the DNA of a, of a cancer cell, chances are that cancer cell is going to go into apoptosis and become necrotic and die. Uh, in normal cells, hopefully, the BRCA1 and BRCA2 will repair the DNA. But if they give somebody chemo and radiation and they don't have the repair mechanism in place, the cancer they're going to present with at a fairly high percentage is going to be more virulent than the cancer they treated. Right. Yeah. You have to survive the treatment sometimes in order to, to get through that. And thinking more clearly about this now, I actually don't think he had chemotherapy or radiation. I think they just took the, they just took the margins and that was it. I have to, I'm going to text him after this. I also am going to, I also am going to text him and make sure that I, I can talk about him on this podcast. I think, I, I think he's given me permission in the past because I've, I've talked about it before, but I just going to get, make sure he's cool with that. Um, but yeah, I think luckily he didn't do that. Keep a CRP less than three and, and that'll really decrease the probability of, um, of, of him presenting with cancer. Yeah, that was a very stressful time for, for all of us, but, uh, but he's very, He's very intelligent, obviously, and he really cleaned things up and was and had the light bulb go off and go, oh, wait a second, I need to, to rethink some things I'm doing. And uh, and he did so. And to see him show up with some Velasta and to know that he 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 listens and watches some of the things that I've been doing online and stuff is so great. You know, it's so great. Um, uh, so let me see if there's any other. Um, if there's any other questions here that I think that we should hit on this podcast. We're almost at two hours and I really, really appreciate the time. Um, you know, one of the things, uh, <laughs> one of the, the more interesting comments, it was sort of a joke, but uh, one of the reasons uh, people say that this can't be true is because you're still alive. And they were like, God bless the both of you talking about this stuff, because anybody that uh, comes out with something as powerful as this there has to be, you're going to disappear soon. Do you have, do you have any concerns about, uh, about, um, you know, stirring the pot in the, in the medical community? Early on, I, I understood how to come in under the radar screen from things that I had done in my past on projects. So we decided to come in under the radar screen, no sales, no marketing. It was only word of mouth. And when people saw results, and yes, we, we've received our fair share of threats. You, ha you have, you have received threats. Uh, legal, legal threats or like what, like what or, or your windows in your car were smashed in. Like, what are we talking about? I'm from Staten Island, so I immediately think, you know, <laughs> violence. One was violent. The other two were official state complaints. Wow. Okay. But one was violent. Okay. I was hanging Christmas lights in my front yard. And when the lights went out, I stepped back. My fence blew up about four inches under my armpit. And I still have the bullet hole through my fence in my front yard. No kidding. Somebody took a shot at you from a car? No, from, uh, from the woods across the street. Well, I, when I asked this question, I thought we were going to have a little joke about it. I did not think that, uh, that, that your answer was going to be this. Wow, I'm so sorry. That must have been terrifying. Did, now, was the person caught? Uh, well, uh, ran in the house, <clears throat> immediately called the police. There's a police report on it. And police came out. He looked at it. He walked up in the woods, drew his pistol, came back. And uh, I said, is it possible this was a deer hunter? He said, oh, no. He said, these woods are too thick. But he says, up here in the leaves, I can see where somebody was reclined, and, and there was a boot print that he took a casting of. So whoever did it was sitting 30 yards in front of my house at me. When was this? Was this years ago? Was this recently? Four years ago. So it is for real. And then um, um, the two official state complaints, I won both of those in rebuttal um, because. 
we're in the business of providing information under the First Amendment. And it just so happens we have a product. I don't charge for the information. I'm a researcher. And under the, the Freedom of Information Act of the First Amendment, I'm allowed to talk about all of this leading edge type research. So the, the heat's off. Now, when the police officer, I had spoken to an FBI agent and um, he basically informed me to keep this from happening was to go public with everything I knew. Well, that's bad for business, but that's okay. Um, so I went public. Now I have over 200 videos. Filed a patent. Yeah, fi filed a patent. So we just went public. So there's no advantage of taking me out now. Right, because everything exists without you anyway. Your the information lives forever on the internet. The company, unless they blow up every <laughs> the entire block, you know that you're you're. The Pandora is out of the box. We come in right. slowly, opened up the box lid, let Pandora out, and um, now they can't stop it. Because we've got one in this. They can't stop the information. We're opening up a, a production facility in Australia. Um, it, we're in 37 countries now. Whether I'm here or not doesn't matter. Well, God bless you for doing it. <laughs> that I mean, that's frightening. That's, you know, you're out hanging up your Christmas lights and people are trying to take you out and then pushing on you legally. Um, you know, I mean, for s somebody might uh, just go, well, you know, I can manufacture this stuff myself, myself, my friends, my family will always have this uh, to use and I'll just continue it that way. But you didn't do that. So thank you. Yeah, I, I gave a talk in, in Washington, D.C. Um, to a bunch of pretty important people. There were several um, hospital representations there. John Hopkins. Fred Bishi was there. Uh, Fred Bishi was there, too, as a matter of fact. Um, after that point, the NIH began, I think, to prove me wrong. I, I still believe that in my mind. But they issued a lot of money, millions of dollars, to now go re go and research, is the this astaxanthin have this effect as an anti-inflammatory? So since 2020, you can go and Google NIH and astaxanthin and whatever disease you want to put there, and all of the NIH research papers are now public. So that's uh, that's the real the real uh, crux of it. Uh, the other part of the patent is the title of the patent really set people off because the the patent is a method um, using of uh, using astaxanthin for the treatment of inflammatory disease, particularly a treatment for cancer. And for to make that kind of a claim, the patent office actually allowed that to remain in the patent, but the FDA requires this cannot be used for the cure, treatment, or you know whatever the standard thing is on their label. So now I got two government agencies in conflict with each other, and I have to report both. Wow. Yeah, that is that's confusing. Yeah. Well, that's like that's like the cannabis laws. Remember, it was it was you know it was, it was statewide legal, nationally illegal. Like you know, what do you do? But people are smart enough to figure this out when they start seeing the testimonials. And yep. the, the one thing that came out of this is that if you have the research to back this up, going to court would be a major plus. I'm, I've, I've, I've fought court battles before. This is, this is not scary to me at all. This is a great story that the public needs to know. That was... Um... That was something, too, that the, in the comment section, everyone was like, where's the research? Where's the peer reviewed research? You know, this has to be researched, all these things. It, it just basic quick assumptions they were making as they were thumbing their way through a comment. Um, do you have and, and I've looked at the website uh, pretty much in depth, but is there a place where you have a link to a lot of this research or is there a place where they should just look for it if someone wants to dig deep into this and look at all the studies? I think on the website, we actually have a research clip that they can go on to with all the NIH backed up research on it. Um, the, the clinical work, and it's, it's one thing that pharmaceutical companies are very successful in stopping the holistic side of the, of the world in, in that people don't have the money to do the clinical studies. 
And it's a weapon that's used by uh, the pharmaceutical companies to keep anybody. So they've got everybody convinced that clinical studies are actually required to prove eff efficacy. The reality is that's not really the case. The reality is when you start seeing response, you've got very definitive causation and response. There's definitely a cattle culture in the holistic health world where they, they will see a two minute video and then just go do something because they, you know, because people just sort of follow the leader in that. But when it comes to the clinical research and things, I, you know, my work gets criticized a lot as a colon hydrotherapist. And, you know, I always respond with like, we don't need cl clinical research. The people that come and get the work with no side effect and feel amazing and watch things improve and get benefit from it, like you could have all your research. Like we don't need it. Like we're just going, we're going to do what feels right and what makes sense to us. And we're fine to do that. And we're happy to do that. The advantage, the advantage I have is everything is basic out of a textbook. You go to any biochemistry textbook and the entire mechanism of how astaxanthin work is detailed in that textbook, it's taught. This whole free radical chemistry has been known for 40 years. And the doctors have been trained in this and they still won't do it because there's no money in, in the prevention of a disease. There's only money in treating the symptoms of the disease. So this is all common, concise, taught, um, information. This, this, there's nothing clinical here. It's already in the pathways and the biological pathways that we study. The, the, the things that I taught in the biological pathways of Ross um, in involvement in interleukin-6. I wrote papers on it, uh, how it affects inflammation during COVID, how it will shut down interleukin-6, which is the inflammatory interleukin. Uh, it will activate interleukin-10, which is the breaks to the inflammatory response from COVID. All of this is already known. Now, the doctors, when they say, well, where's the clinical study? All they're doing is admitting their ignorance in the fact that they failed their biochemistry course. Right. You know, Dr. Bishi has had uh, interactions with different uh, medical doctors over the years, things about vitamin B12 and things. And he would he would uh, in the conversation, he would cite different pages from classic uh, uh, medical physiology textbooks like, you know, Holes or um, Guyton's textbook of medical physiology. And he'd be like, it's right here in the textbook that you studied in school that a healthy intestine can produce its own vitamin B12 or whatever conversation he was having. And it's just like they just forgot or they didn't pay attention or. That's exactly my point is when, they, when doctors bring that up, all they're telling me is how ignorant or stupid, depending on their intention, they really are. You would not ask that if you, if you understood what you were taught. Yeah. And look, there's brilliant doctors, but there is the joke. What do you call the doctor that graduates at the bottom of the class? Doctor. They're all called doctor once they get out of there, you know, it's. Uh, well, Sam, we've been at this for two hours, so I'm going to let you go. I really, I really enjoyed this conversation. I'm so excited to get this out. You know, we've, we've, we've been officially debunked. There's videos where people have my face on it and your face on it that say debunked and stuff um, from all the popularity that those social media videos got. So I'm super excited to release this podcast. I'll break it up in clips. I'll put it out on social media. Uh, we'll get more people to to understand because I think most people in the holistic health community, like I said, there's a little bit of follow the leader cattle culture in that thing. And I really, one of my missions is to get people to really understand how these things work so they can evaluate all sorts of different products and practices. Um, so I'm super excited to get this out to everyone and I appreciate your time so much. Thank you, Sam. Thank you, Michael. I've I've enjoyed it very much. Me too. You made it past the two hour mark, which means you probably found this podcast as interesting as I did. If you would like to support this podcast and you're interested in buying some Velasta Astaxanthin, please click the link in the description and use the code, all caps, PURE, the word PURE, P-U-R-E. And you can also support this podcast by enrolling in a course at everydaydetoxacademy.com. It is the crown jewel of all of the work that I've ever done, and we are about to release a new masterclass on deep tissue cleansing with Gil Jacobs, the colon hydrotherapist guru of New York City. 
So um, we're having a baby any day now. We're right in the window. I'm recording this uh, in my home office right now, um, and we're right in the window of the due date. So um, not sure when the next podcast is coming out, but I'm going to do my best to get some of the ones out from the past. I have a bunch in the bank, great episodes with Gil Jacobs, Dr. Fred Bishy. And uh, anyway, as always, I appreciate, appreciate, appreciate the support that you've all given to this podcast. Um, and yeah, I'll see you on the next one. Thank you.